please join me in welcoming Amitis. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming out. I'm going to try and be as uh, quick as possible because I know there's a lot of stuff on TV tonight that you probably <laughs> want to catch. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe I should just go extra long. Um, you know, I have a long slide demo that uh, basically shows you all the stuff that I've worked on for a very, very long time. But um, I'm going to go through that quickly and tell you a little bit about each thing. Um, you're going to see in my work you, uh, that uh, there's, there's an element that has uh, a reference to shrines over and over and over again. Uh, Motevali, my last name, actually means keeper of the shrine. And my family keeps a shrine in uh, the northern region of Iran, a city called Sari. That's where my family's originally from. I was born in Tehran, but that's where, you know, my folks, my peoples, everybody's there. And we still have a shrine there, so there might actually be a clip from a video I did of that shrine. But let's see. All right, so I want to start with this series called um, The Bikini Manifesto. Basically, it's, it's a series that I started when I was in grad school. And I continue to work on these bikinis. It comes up over and over and over again in my work. While I was in undergrad, I uh, actually, at some point, really needed a job. And, um, and I was really broke. I kicked out my boyfriend, didn't have enough money for the rent. And um, one of my teachers was... Um, Angela Davis, I forgot her name for a second, it was Angela Davis. <laughs> she was my mentor, she was like my hero. But anyway, uh, Angela was unionizing a strip club. I, I actually started to work at the Lusty Lady. I worked there for a little while, and I was like, wait, I'm dancing naked, and um, I'm getting paid $7 an hour. Um, no, I, I think I can make more money, so I got deeply into it. I was making like $3,000 a night, it was crazy. And that was, you know, at the height of kind of technology stuff in the Bay Area. So um, while I was doing this, I, was, I wasn't really making work about it. But then I stopped. I went to grad school and I was trying to process everything I went through. And also this like women's studies background, you know, the combination. And um, it, was, it was at a pivotal moment in grad school when someone told me, um, they were trying to tell me about my culture. I, I always love it when people try and tell me about myself. And they said, oh, your culture is so, it's so sexist, you know, they just treat women so poorly and the hijab and everything. And, you know, how can they say that that's, that that's womanhood? And I was like, well, you know, there's so many constructs of femininity. And I really started to think about constructs of femininity. And I'm saying this to you because you're going to see that come up over and over and over again. So this first piece I did was uh, I got, you know, an eye beam and I hung it by one bikini strap on the wall. And then I just started to experiment more and more and more with the bikinis. And this was a full room installation. You could actually walk into it, but you almost always had to bow your head down to go in, because I really wanted people to have a crotch in their face, and if they wanted to go in, they would actually have to bow their head under and you know, show a little respect. This was actually a, a um, weighed about a ton, and it was suspended by one bikini, and it was one of those spider bikinis, you know, that has like a little patch over the nipples and flows out like a spider, it was neon orange. And this one bikini was holding up this one ton eye beam. It was magic. And, um, and then I started to experiment with drawings. And um, there's a term in Farsi, it's jende. Jende means whore but it also actually means that your body's been taken over by jinns, these little demons. So I did a series of the bikini drawings, and I had this friend, Daza, she was a lowrider model, so she posed for me, and I drew the jinn all in her body. And I considered what I was doing at that time also truly Islamic art, because I was really, these are geometric shapes I'm referencing, and we may be talking about the physical form, but there is no presence of, of the body, right? So um, continuing on with my uh, Islamic art, I, I stopped making bikinis for a long time because at some point I went somewhere and someone pointed at me and said, there's the bikini girl. And I was like, no more bikinis. So uh, 
a few years back, I, I went to do uh, my first solo at uh, Aran Gallery, who represents me in Tehran. And I decided to take the bikinis back. So um, they were Islamic art. It made perfect sense in the Islamic Republic of Iran to um, take these bikinis. So there they are. I'm gonna flow through a few different things. You know, I did a lot of stuff where I was kind of appropriating various people's art. This is Ed Ruscha, obviously. And um, I would change it around and kind of like Islamicize it or, um, you know, Iranize it, whatever. I mean, that is, you know, Los Angeles where I live is actually Tehranjelis, so. Um, uh, this says Enfajar, which means implosion. And then uh, I created a series. This was uh, just, just before 9-11, actually, but um, it's a series based on uh, iconoclasm, basically taking away the, the images of, of, um, of icons, right, the faces. And there were people I loved, a lot of people I loved and some people I hated. You know, that's actually, that's a minaret on Princess Diana's face uh, that was destroyed in, in the first Gulf War. Um, and, you know, BP was really responsible for so much that went on in, in Iraq. And that minaret was, was an ancient minaret in, in Iraq. So then we get into the shrine installations, and um, this is from a series of drawings called Copenhagen, where I had um, a flashlight pointed at me, and I was um, praying. I was doing the namaz. There was actually a room in a place that I danced at in San Francisco called Mitchell Brothers, and uh, it was called the Copenhagen Room. It has nothing to do with the city Copenhagen. But um, in the Copenhagen Room, you could walk in with a flashlight. It was pitch black, and you could point this light at wherever you wanted to on your dancer and you know, have a very focused view. So I thought it was interesting because I, I, you know, throughout my uh, upper education, I was getting a sense that there was a real concentrated look at my religion and, and uh, my background and my culture. And uh, I thought the flashlight would be an interesting way to look at it. So these were large, large drawings. I don't have them all in there. But it led to this installation. And this installation has a series, three sets of, um, of photos in it. And it's a bunch of bowls. There's all these rituals around bowls and cleansing in Shia Islam. So um, basically, I submerged these photographs. One set was of me praying in my hijab that I would pray at home, actually. It's not the hijab you go out, but it's your very personal kind of relationship you have with, with, the, uh, with uh, Allah. And then um, another set is of me just, you know, no makeup, completely nude, but not really able to see any parts of my body, not sexualized, and I'm bathing in these bowls. And another set was um, of me in lingerie, and I was kind of like posing like Victoria's Secret type of photos. And um, this piece, I, I was asked to reinstall it, you know, years later in San Francisco, and it got, it got censored in San Francisco of all cities. <laughs> But, you know, the whole point was, again, I was looking at these constructs of femininity, you know, and, and binaries and things like that. And um, in San Francisco, they said, no, we only want the ones of you in the hijab. And I was like, well, but see, that just kind of kills the whole idea. But anyway, uh, of course, they decided to censor the whole, the whole piece. And that's a photograph of me underneath, um, actually taken on that very wood surface. So a lot of these kind of make references to rituals, cleansing rituals. You know, this was called ghusl, and ghusl is a, is a cleansing ritual that you do if you've done something really dirty, and it helps kind of clean you, like if you've had, you know, some really naughty sex, or, you know, if you stole something or whatever, um, you can do a ghusl and cleanse yourself of, you know, that naughty deed. So, um, you know, I, I took many trips back to Iran, and I'm represented by a gallery out there, so I have to go back all the time. But one time I took my mother. It was the worst thing I could do. I actually got a fellowship to take my mom. And she was such an undercover diva. And um, she was like, no, I don't want to go. Oh, no, this place is dirty. I never thought my mom, working class woman, would ever say, no, it's dirty. No, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. It turned out when we went back to Iran, most of what we saw were gravestones. And that was why she didn't want to go back. Most of the people that she loved were gone. My family actually fled in 1977, and this was before the revolution. We left because of the Shah. 
So um, we came here because my father was politically involved and we had to leave at that time. So we got here, we had no idea we'd never see these folks again. And um, here's my grandmother. So we were visiting my grandmother. So based on that trip, I created another shrine piece, which is um, I basically got an entire floor in a gallery and I uh, reconstructed it with marble. And on it, I etched uh, different poems by a poet, Ahmad Shamlu, who's a revolutionary poet. Here's a shrine I made out of um, clear plastic knives when they were banned at the airport because an, an Iranian guy, some, I don't know what happened exactly, I don't remember the full story, but some Iranian guy looked really threatening with uh, a plastic knife, so they took him away. So this is, this is actually a photograph of my family's shrine, and that's my aunt. Um, it's there and, and the masjid in Sari are the two, I'm, I'm like one of the only people who can go in there and photograph it because I'm, I'm a motivali. So I went in and I was, I was just kind of looking at it and really looking at the way it was made. And I was looking at the, the concept of a shrine, right? So to me, a shrine looked, and from everything I heard, it looked like a public sculpture. It looked like something that people in the community came together and collaborated and were able to create uh, a work of art together that they agreed upon. And all of the rituals that I saw around the shrine were really like public performance. So these were performances and rituals that people did that looked just like art. So I decided at that point that a lot of my work, no matter what it was, was going to emulate this public art and these types of public performances. So this is the shrine. I recreated this shrine uh, shortly after that trip. And this was a shrine that I made um, that was dedicated to people who were shot and killed by uh, the police by law enforcement. I did a study in 2008, and um, during that year while I was doing my study, uh, two people I know were killed. One was a close friend. And I ran over to uh, his family's house, and they told me the full story. So I really got deep into this. I mean, it actually took me to this place of intense uh, depression, too. But uh, I got to hear all these stories from around the world and looking at globalized, kind of militarized occupation internationally. So this piece was, uh, although the outside had images, I'd, I hand carved this piece. It took me about two months. I worked day and night. But um, it had images, faces of people who were killed in, in Los Angeles County. But inside I included names of people who were killed throughout that year around the world and told their stories. So the piece traveled and um, on, on the left that's in Oaxaca. And, of course, I, I found different people in different spaces who were killed. And uh, in Chicago, the other one on the right is in Chicago. And then these are some of the street pieces because they were actually stencils. So um, I was able to create stencils and I, I give them out to folks to take it out to the very sites where people were, were killed. And this was my friend Christian Portillo. Christian Portillo um, was shot and killed by the sheriffs. He was waiting in this car for his girlfriend. It was in his parents' house. And, um, you know, all of a sudden a cop rolls up and there was no sound, nothing, no flashlight, just rolls up to him. He was on his phone. He jumped and the cop shot him point blank in the heart. Um, when his parents came out to see what was going on, of course, they held them down with their guns. And um, the following day, the propaganda began about um, how Chris was a notorious drug dealer, how you know he was a scumbag and he deserved to die, and none of it was true. And I was reading the blogs. So the piece I was doing just hit even, even harder for me. And it was such a necessary healing for me as well. So I'll show you a few of these drawings. So this was actually one of uh, the pieces that I guess people would, would call one of my original kind of social practice pieces, although I never knew what that term was. I, I think I still don't really know. But um, when I was teaching, I, uh, my students and I organized. I was teaching at a place called Lock High School. It was actually considered one of the worst schools in the country. And um, it was actually a really beautiful place. I mean, I hear people say that about Detroit. Oh, that's such an awful place. And I'm like, oh, it's so beautiful. I constantly see beauty. So 
Uh, I don't know, I guess people are a little blind. But it was really a beautiful place. There was, there was a lot of intellect, a lot of creativity, a lot of uh, imagination, and um, very little resources. And it was highly neglected, and it was highly policed. So um, my students and I, after a series of events, and you know, I, it's pretty brutal, uh, we organized. Um, and when we organized, I was given five pink slips. Uh, it actually became a big deal with the ACLU and all these other people. So I was fired f five different ways, and one of them was for drinking coffee in the hallway. <laughs> Somehow, I guess they thought they could fire me for drinking coffee in the hallway. But um, we took it to court, of course, and um, at, at that point, my students and I started to create a lot of work. And, um, and then this was one of the pieces. So this was uh, recreating one of the lesson plans that I had, and in, we did a self-portrait. This was my self-portrait. But um, my self-portrait, uh, in, in the big one, it's all the story of you know, how the students and I organize and the conditions at the school, and um, it's all written in text. And then here's another piece about that, that same topic, and another one. Okay, so then we get into performance, and I think I'm going too slow, so I'm going to go quickly. You can just kind of see some of the stuff that's going on. Oh, oh yeah, okay, that's why that's there, okay. So uh, a lot of this is actually, I'm going to focus on, uh, for the everyday Imam Zade on, on Denmark, because Denmark is um, a place that I did a residency at, and of all the places that I've uh, traveled to for my everyday Imam Zade series, it was one of the most brutal. Denmark doesn't actually allow mosques. Um, the, Denmark is the home of this cartoon. And of course, Denmark's government and, and media and everyone said that, you know, well, it's free speech, so you should be allowed to put up these images, which I completely agree with free speech. But um, there's a point when people are, are they really have um, a foot on their neck on, on the day to day. And then on top of living really horribly you, um, and being humiliated every day, you are thoroughly humiliated in your faith because when you have very little in your life, sometimes the only thing that, that you have is your spirituality. And so then people's spirituality, their culture, their religion is completely spit on. And so of course, uh, you guys may have read about this, it caused a lot of outrage in Denmark. So I was in the very city where this man who uh, created this piece um, lived. It's called Arhus, and in Arhus is, uh, what's considered the largest uh, housing project uh, called Gellerup. And I did my residency there, but I'm gonna play this video for you. Oops, no, go back. Video. Ametis Motabali. I was uh, born in Tehran, Iran, and um, I actually live in Los Angeles, California. I've lived in Los Angeles most of my life. I'm a visual artist. I, I do uh, kind of contemporary conceptual work that um, changes medium. So sometimes it's performance, sometimes it's video, sometimes it's installation. Um, <laughs> Well, today I, I did uh, a piece that um, I started, I, I think it was in either 2007 or 2008, that's um, called Jokes on Me, uh, Stupid Muslim Joke. And um, basically I had a lot of uh, 
pieces of, of uh, stickers all over me with jokes from the internet, collected from the internet about stupid Muslims. And um, many of the jokes uh, came, came out around the time that the cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad came out as well. And um, I really felt like, uh, of course, I was very offended by some of the jokes, and some of them were, were you know, somewhat funny. They even elicited laughter out of me. But I felt like there needed to be something that was a dialogue and also a reclaiming. So I reclaimed them by actually me printing them and, and uh, printing them on my body. And I don't want to pretend that they don't exist. They, they do exist. They're out there. But also I have a dialogue with people and because it's on my skin and I am a Muslim woman, culturally, spiritually, all of that. Um, I get to have an exchange with people on the Muslim body because there's so much, uh, so much that's happening in the world right now with the Muslim body that um, I felt like it was important to have this dialogue um, literally about my skin, about, about my flesh. And, um, and so uh, I wanted to do this piece, redo this piece here in Denmark because when I came here, there's all this talk, uh, anti-Islam talk, and where I was seeing most of it was, of course, in um, printed material and in the press. Um, there's definitely a segregation that I'm seeing in terms of, of cultures. But I just knew, um, you know, I had uh, some of the most progressive friends that I've had in the States were from Denmark. And so I knew that there had to be a, a, a narrative that was um, hidden in terms of, of mass media, but very much in, in, in the psyche of, of most uh, Danes. Anyway, I think uh, you probably saw enough of that to get a gist of the performance. Um, here, here it is at uh, different locations. Uh, same performance, and then this was a recreation of uh, of a um, Spassky and and um, oh, who was that American uh, chess player? Why am I forgetting his name now? Do you remember? Someone remembers. Bobby Fisher. Bobby Fisher thank you. So this was uh, this was a famous uh, match between Spassky and Fisher that uh, another artist and I, um, H. K. Zamani, created in in kind of Iranian drag. So. Uh, here's, this is actually the performance inside of the shrine that I told you about where I was writing the stories. Um, and then, uh, I, I, like I said, I like to appropriate a lot of different artists. I've appropriated Adrian Piper quite a bit. I mean, with, with the self-portrait piece, it was self-portrait of uh, me as, as a terrorist. or Self-portrait exaggerating my terrorist features, that's what it was. Um, so this time, uh, this is her funk lessons. I don't know if any of you guys have, know about that piece, but um, basically she was teaching funk in a museum, how to dance to funk music. And, um, and so I, uh, I, I kind of curated this exhibition, and um, because I worked with my gallery, she also wanted me to do a performance on, on the opening day. And um, uh, I, we brought artists from, from Tehran, the gallery, Aran, that, um, that I work with. And... Um, and I recreated a, a dance from the south side of Iran called Baba Karam. And it's, it's a real interesting dance because it really plays with gender. Um, it's uh, very sexual when people dance together, you know, they get real close to each other and, you know, they're like bending over. They have these gestures of like bending over and, and um, bending into someone else and getting really close, as you can see. And then oftentimes it's, it's women in drag that will perform this. And then I, I, I kind of like to play with my, you, you know, I, I, I definitely have certain political stances, but when it comes to my work, I, I, I know it kind of seems like I do, but a lot of times I don't. I really want the dialogue to happen and, and see where things will land. Um, but uh, at a certain time, I was kind of uh, inspired by a few people I knew and, and myself, and I wanted to kind of uh, create a, a few characters that were these hyper kind of orientalized uh, people, because when a lot of times when you're not actually living in the env environment that you're claiming or representing, um, you end up doing a kind of caricature, you know, uh, in, in your day-to-day -day life. And uh, in, in order for me to kind of like get that out my system, I created a couple of uh, performative characters. And one was uh, A.K. Ami, 
so AK AMI is, is like super militant, you know, like how uh, you guys probably know, know a few people who right after 9-11 decided to take on the hijab and like ran around everywhere and were like super militant. And um, I, I knew a few people like that. So basically I took photographs in different places throughout um, the states that were in ruins. And um, I really wanted to kind of document third world conditions here in the so-called first world. And then, um, you know, AKAMI even did a print at Self-Help Graphics and, um, and uh, a couple of performances. The woman with the orange scarf is my mom. She collaborates with me on this. So she has a performative character name too called Malika Kubra. And um, the other character is this, the Sand Ninja. And the Sand Ninja is like this kind of uh, goddessy, belly dancing, tribal, um, super exotified character. And she's very hairy. She has a unibrow. And she decides to decolonize people by giving them unibrows. And um, she does palm readings and fortune telling and things like that and coffee ground readings. And uh, here she is in, in, um, in an outfit much like Josephine Baker. The pita bread started to fall out, so I had to tuck it under, but um, I had a headdress. This was right after Egypt, you know, people were covering their heads with the plastic bottles, and so I created this headdress and my pita skirt and some passports. I was telling you guys about these passports. I found this picture, I was so excited, so. And she, she gives away items like this, these little dime sacks full of sand from her homeland. This was her New Year's card to everyone. And then this is from, uh, there's actually a series um, that's uh, a, a centerfold of, of this kind of strap-on bomb thing. And there's a couple of really gross pictures, like disgusting gross. And I, you know, like with lots of glued on hair crotch shots. And they were bought by this really famous collector. I, you know, I don't sell a lot of work. You, you guys saw the kind of work I do. A lot, and a lot of it isn't even sellable. And I'm like, really? They, they want to buy that? A giant picture of an like extremely hairy crotch with a bomb strap to it? Whatever. Um, Anyway, so I also like to look at images in the media, um, you know, not so much to glorify them, but to glorify the media's <laughs> imagery. But I also change them a little bit. So like on, on the left there is actually, it, it was a funeral for uh, uh, my friend Farid's uh, cousin in, in, uh, in Ramla. And um, uh, everyone there had, had uh, you know, green heads, headbands and uh, I changed the, the wording in there. So it says three different words in Farsi. <clears throat> it says, it's a word play, Shahid, Shahed, Shayad, which means like uh, Shahid, uh, uh, shah, Shahed is, is a witness, a Shahid is a martyr, and uh, Shayad means maybe. Um, and then on, on this side, I kind of changed up this very famous um, you know, image that was, uh, that was actually a, a created, this was a uh, created propaganda image for, for Western media. And um, I thought about the fact that media is kind of creates a theater of the world, and so I kind of created my own series that um, create my own revolution in, in ways. Um, I had a mentor that uh, was part of the Watts Rebellion, and he told me that the giant palm trees, that they thought about how they, they could uh, cut those down and block the road so it can keep the feds away. And so I included all of those images. There's a lot of stuff. I'm going to show you a few. I like this one a lot. This was actually in Iraq, and um, the guy was wearing a Steelers jersey. And there was another guy selling food. But of course, I, I completely uh, took out all of the background and, um, and really stripped it of, of all of its context. And then um, I'm really infatuated with flags. I know everybody is. But um, th there's these religious flags that I like to make secular. And one of the things is I know I make a lot of references to uh, Islam, but one of the things I want to do in, in my art and in all of the iconography is I actually want to secularize it. I want to pull it away from the religion and um, make it more about, you know, having access to, to change. And so these all say, uh, instead of the religious slogans, they say things like power to the people in Farsi. So, um, of course, I'm obsessed with Franz Fanon, and I've created many series on Franz Fanon, but these are based on um, the large Shia flags, and these were giant flags, actually, that, that do you guys know, you, you know a little bit about the difference of Shia and Sunni, because I don't want to just, you know, speak in 
people don't know, but um, anyway, the, the Shia, the original Shia martyrs carried these into battle, these giant velvet flags. And um, I'm really into them, and, and I'm really into kind of like the kitsch of the culture too, but I want to recreate it in my own way. Um, so at some point I got a bunch of my baby pictures and got these out. And these pictures were collected at, <laughs> on their way out of the country by Homeland Security. And, um, and uh, I had to, that was a big deal. I had to actually get lawyers and stuff because they were gonna, they were gonna pull me in for these little baby pictures. I mean, you can tell those aren't real guns, right? <laughs> Come on. And the most threatening of all. Why do you think she's threatening? She's wearing hijab. Um, this is me. I was 12 years old. This is called huri. Huri means um, like a little angel. Um, I was 12 years old. It's a self-portrait. I took it myself. And um, I recreated it 72 times. So it's 72 little angels. This is like the angel you'll get if you, be if you become a martyr. Me as a 12-year-old. Um, so in 2009, that was the trip that I took my mom to Iran. Uh, again, you know, it was a really tough trip on a lot of levels. She did love the fact that 2009 was election year and we got to see a lot of things go on. This is election time and people are pretty quiet here about elections. They're pretty reserved. I, was, I went to uh, Trader Joe's in, what's that city again? Gross Point today and um, this woman was in line ahead of me and she was talking about like I don't understand why people put these signs in front of their house about who they're gonna vote for I mean that's a very private thing and I was like oh wow in Iran where everyone talks about how repressive it is everyone goes out and talks about exactly who they're gonna vote for and why and they get into debates on the street and it was actually a really beautiful process just pre-election people would literally stop in the middle of the street and you know they'd come out and chant the the names of the different people that they we're going to vote for, and um, it was very exciting. So there, uh, my mom and I voted in Isfahan, and then I created a piece that really wanted to um, reference, because a year later I was invited to do a show um, at Iran Gallery again in Tehran, and um, I, I wanted to reference the, uh, the election without actually referencing it. So the way I did it was, was through civil rights movement. And I got uh, photographs from SNCC. I've, I've studied SNCC for a very long time, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, in case you don't know. But um, I took these uh, photos from SNCC and I, 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 I sewed them onto these humongous flags. They're really, really large. And the show looked like that. And then I uh, got Fannie Lou Hamer's speech at the DNC where she talked about what she had to face when she went to vote, the fact that she was humiliated the whole time and then, uh, and then eventually arrested and beaten and people she knew were, were raped and tortured. And um, I uh, basically wrote that on the windows so that uh, everyone can, can have a sense of that because Iranians tended to have this feeling like it's only their struggle, that they're the only ones suffering. And that's because they're, they're enclosed. Uh, a lot of times they don't have access to what goes on around the world. And uh, the Iranian government likes to use the civil rights movement and say America is a horrible place, look at what they've done, and you know, often don't reflect on their own uh, atrocities and the way that they treat their own people. So, you know, using the language of, of the Islamic Republic, because they really do like to claim civil rights movement and um, radical movements of the US and make reference to it. I, I made reference to uh, what they did in, in Tehran and all over the country, all over Iran. And this is a video from another um, piece. This is an old video back when razors were, were in. But anyway, um, I shot. And uh, again, I got stopped by the feds. They took all of my videos. See, there's, there's a lot of talk about censorship in Iran, and I have been censored in Iran. But I've been censored far more in this country than I have in Iran. I got stopped by the feds. They took all of my videotapes. They got my camera, and they deleted all of my photographs in my camera. And I, for some reason, that day, I thought I just learned about emailing myself images. So I'd been taking pictures with my phone and sending them to, my, to myself via email. 
And so I created this entire video, which was this kind of fantasy revolution in Los Angeles. I'm, I'm a big fan of Sam Greenlee, uh, the spook who sat by the door. And um, I wanted to kind of recreate this scenario in LA where I really think it should happen first. I really do. Um, and uh, I was able to do that with, uh, with images that I took from the phone because everything else was taken by the feds. This is from another video. These are two, two videos that, that play side by side. One is Love Letters to Jeremy, and then the one right to the right is called Let Them Eat Yellow Cakes. And the reason why that one's called Love Letters to Jeremy is because uh, the photographer, the, the director that I work with, is, um, his name is Jeremy. And it's only because I was performing for him in the camera, so that's why I called it that. But Let Them Eat Yellow Cake on the other side makes reference to the yellow cakes, the uranium that Iran is always accused of creating. So um, basically, I, I wrote backwards. I'm into writing backwards. I do that in a lot of my pieces. But um, I wrote backwards these various mis messages. I was on the outside of a window. And um, I, it, was, it was basically how I feel in, in the American art world, uh, like an outsider. And that I'm exhausting myself constantly, breathing on this window, trying to communicate. And that somehow the, the messages and the ideas and the symbols and iconography that I use is just like not getting through, you know? And then the other one on the other side, I'm very confident. And um, that's the one on the inside. That's when I'm in Iran, because that's where most of my iconography, that's where most of the history that I, uh, that I derive from comes from. And um, I'm writing things like bomb, atom, um, and the different word plays in Farsi. And then I'm writing it in whipped cream on the window and licking it off. You know, I was here in the summer doing a residency and I also was able to do this great Twitter theater project in Denmark. And uh, I'm gonna show you guys a bit more of what I did in Denmark, but um, for some reason, even though I'm so like constantly offensive toward the Danish government, I keep getting invited to do stuff and offend them. So um, th I was actually invited by the queen and um, there was a, a festival and I created this Twitter theater with a collective of people I work with. And um, some of them, including the Fantastic Femmes, who are some teenagers that I worked with in Gelurup, the housing project in Aarhus. But this is from that Twitter theater. And then I want to show you a little bit about where the Imam Zadeh comes from. Uh, on, on the right here is actually my family's uh, Imam Zadeh. And Imam Zadeh means a shrine, basically. Uh, it means the descendant of an Imam. And that's what we call the shrines. And that's my family's shrine. That's my aunt and my mom. And then my grandfather's house right across the way up on top and my aunt's house just below because, you know, the family's been there for so long taking care of these shrines. But I've been able to travel to many different cities. This is actually in California. But um, looking at, at Muslim communities that are transnational Muslims. So I've been doing research with transnational Muslims that have uh, fled either to work or um, have fled because of situations like extreme violence or war, or, uh, poverty. And um, seeing a lot of displaced um, uh, labor uh, and also seeing a, a lot of strange situations like, um, you see this all over Detroit as well, but like there's a hijab shop over on the left bottom. There's a hijab shop across the street and then a strip shop right, you know, right across from it. Uh, liquor stores, you know, with um, family pictures and, and Allah in it. Um, and th this is actually very interesting to me, you know, um, talking to cab drivers, talking to different people all over. Uh, you guys know this place, I'm sure. I got, I got kicked out of this place. And then this is right behind it. So this is on TV about American Muslim, and um, most people on that show are very middle class and um, then directly behind it in Dearborn, Hamtramck. So this is the housing project, Gelurup. Satellites, you know, almost everywhere you go to where there are transnational Muslims is like hella satellites because, you know, people got to get, get their uh, Arabic TV, they got to get their Turkish TV, so... Uh, another way that I did research was um, by going online and, and uh, creating a personality or kind of like a, a um, what's it called? Um, my brain is just not working tonight. An avatar. And um, 
ba basically I create a profile and an avatar and I chatted with different women or uh, different men and some women, not too many, different men around the world and just got a, a sense of, uh, tried to get a sense of what they're doing in terms of labor and I chatted with like 600, something like 600 different people. But um, there's actually, MoCAD I think is gonna um, include a piece that I wrote with some of these chats in their upcoming book called Plug post-industrial complex, which was a great exhibit this summer. So this is the Fantastic Femmes, and really the reason why Fantastic Femmes is really interesting to me is because it was in, in Denmark where Islam is basically not allowed. I mean, the Danish government will say that Islam is allowed, but um, masjids are not allowed. Um, there are no masjids, there's churches, there's temples, everything, but um, the, a space where Muslims can congregate other than inside the ghetto um, is, is not really, something the government likes. Um, it, things are changing there, but we create this space and, and um, inside this little little gallery space they have there in the housing uh, project called Sigrid Stu, uh, we created this space that was like a, a, a feminist, uh, feminist space that was friendly to Muslim women. And um, the reason I say that is because I found that in a lot of feminist spaces, it's not very f friendly to Muslim women. There's always a questioning of the hijab. There's always a questioning of the way people live, the way people practice life, the way people go to school, um, the way they talk to one another. There's, there's, again, that spotlight. And so I really felt like it was important. I, I grew up that way. That was, that was the way I grew up. I actually went to families and I talked to families directly. And I said, look, I'm not going to question you about how, you know, how protective you are with your daughter. I understand. I was there. So um, girls started to come out. Some boys started to come out. It really isn't about uh, just being girls. It's a femme space. So anyone who identifies as femme can come. Anyone who identifies as Muslim can come. You can be Christian, you can be an atheist, you can be whatever. Because I actually look at cultural Muslims anyway. So some people who are culturally Muslim are Jewish and Christian. And we can get into that later if you want to ask me about it. But, um, but anyway, I wanted to create a space that, that, was, that was safe and, 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 and looked at feminists of color who've, who've questioned this, this notion of you know the second wave, third wave that's um, very much based in Western ideology of feminism. So um, we started to create work. We, we do a lot of self-portraits. I, I find that, um, you know, just in working with, with young people, it seems like people like to get a chance to look at themselves and draw themselves. So <laughs> we create self-portraits. But that's especially important for Muslim women because there is such a hyper-intense view of Muslim women. So, um, you know, we... We did the stencil as they wish to pose. They can pose any way. They can delete as many photographs as they want. If they want to sit there for 100 pictures, I'll take it. It's not a problem. I want them to look the way they want to present themselves. And, um, and then the stencils can be, you know, stencils or portraits, however we do them, can, can look any way that they wish for it to look. But then they started to kind of play with it. Um, that's uh, Pia uh, Kersikard. She, she was actually running for office in... in um, in Denmark, and she was like, she's, she's basically a fascist. And uh, she wanted to outlaw hijabs, but um, basically she wanted to outlaw immigrants, <laughs> period. So um, anyway, one of the girls, uh, uh, Asha, right here, uh, created that piece where she put, put her in a hijab. And then, um, you know, like I said, boys come. And um, my, it's just my favorite thing to see girls with spray cans, you know, girls with nails and spray cans. One of the things that I, I've talked to people about is if you get gel nails, because I'm, I'm a femme and I'm not ashamed, you know, I'm totally into being femme. And I know a lot of girls that, or, or boys that, that want to be femme. So, you know, have nails, have hair, have whatever, have hijab, have fashion. It doesn't mean that you can't make art. It doesn't mean that we can't come together and create change. And, um, if you get gel nails, by the way, you can spray paint, you can do whatever, and you can just wash it off. So um, that's just a tip in case you're interested. So we did, we did public pieces. We went around and hung their portraits all over the city. And we hung up signs about, about the housing project, Geller Up, and we put hearts and you know, things like that. And um, it, it was fun. You know, I, had a, I had such an amazing time. And uh, I focus on Denmark just because even though there's certain comforts, like there is actually um, a, 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 a stipend that everyone is given. So they have some money, they have food, 
but there's just this very repressive environment and very sad environment. And also there's a lot of immigrants who come from situations of extreme warfare. People from, um, from Gaza, from uh, Sudan, from Somalia, from uh, Afghanistan, from Kurdistan. So um, just these intense lives, things that people have seen, things that these young women have seen in their lives. And um, you know, I, I, I know that art, for me, create a change. I, you know, I'm not, uh, I know a lot of people will say, you know, oh, art therapy, it's so hokey, whatever. I'm not talking about art therapy. I'm talking about having a vision and having a voice and art is that outlet. It has been for me, it completely changed my life. And, um, and you know, I grew, I grew up into poverty. I was born poor in Iran and whatever all of my family could get together to send us to the United States, they did. And then my, my family were manual laborers. And art was the thing that actually got me to go all over the world. And I really want to talk with um, various communities and talk about the fact that this can be a voice and it can be a voice for social change and for presenting ourselves in ways that I think is very important. Um, one of the things that for me, this was our visit to the museum. I just thought it was, you know, there's so much prettier than Maryland, but the whole photo is really pretty. One of, the thing that, one of the things that's important for me in terms of working in communities, and sometimes I work with young women, and sometimes like in Anaheim, I'm working with seniors. Um, it, it, it's really about uh, understanding that, that there doesn't need to be this binary of like either denounce your culture or cling on to it super heavy, like more than you would when you were back home, right? So I, I see that. I've definitely seen that in Hamtramck, and I've talked to girls, and they were like, oh, yeah, my family definitely didn't live like that in, in, in Bangladesh, you know. But anyway, um, it's, it, it's really an opportunity to talk about feminisms, the fact that there's not one, one way of practicing about change, and that the fact that there's not just one way of creating change. And um, I really... Uh, I really, really like to talk about um, a lot of Fanonian um, ideology when it comes to when we, when we represent our culture. So we don't have to be the sole representatives, but we also don't have to sell out our people, you know? We don't have to give uh, a kind of dominant culture what they want in order for us to be seen, be heard, to get exhibits. And, um, and uh, you know, that, that's a dialogue that actually does come up. And, and, in even this space, which is the Deflex space. Sarah Wagner, who actually runs Deflex, is here, and I was honored to have been their first resident in Hamtramck. Um, it's a beautiful space. Uh, I, I was, I mean, even today, my heart just squeezes when I think about Detroit and Hamtramck because it's so incredible that people live in so much poverty, but in that poverty are able to, um, there's so much more creativity because you gotta be creative so that you can live, so that you can eat, so that you can be warm in the, in the winter. You know, so there's just far more creativity than I would see in, you know, more affluent places. But along with that creativity, and of course all of the amazing art that's happening here was like fresh food and produce all summer, and it was, it was just an incredible environment. It was a very friendly and loving environment where um, my hosts were, were literally constantly concerned about their neighbors and their neighbors were concerned about them. And it was a beautiful thing for me to see, especially in a transnational Muslim neighborhood with people who have just recently migrated here. Hamdramic is a great opportunity for a lot of people. Uh, although it looks blown out to some folks, for people who come with no money, that's, that's a place where they can actually own property, own a home, which they may not have in, in their so-called homeland, you know? So um, for, for me, it was a beautiful situation, and I'm really, you know, my, my heart is warmed that uh, I was able to see this, because when I went to, when I was in Denmark, it was so much hostility. Um, you know, when, when you're brown in Denmark, I, you oftentimes get called uh, the word Nia, and at first, I was walking down the street, and with some of my Somali sisters, and Someone was like, Nia, come here. And I'm like, oh, my name's Ami. It's not Nia. You know, I, I didn't know what, what that meant. So th then my, my girls were like, no, that means the N word. And I was like, what? I mean, I was so caught off guard. So we had a discussion about this. And I was like, so why do people get away with that so often? They said, well, you know, they talk about free speech. And I was like, well, and so how come nobody's knocking anybody out? Because at a certain point, 
When you are constantly humiliated, when you are constantly humiliated, you're going to have to knock somebody out so it stops. And um, it hasn't happened yet in Denmark. But I remember writing back, I was constantly Skyping with my girls because we were also working on, on the Twitter project. I was like, you guys all have to move to Detroit. I don't know how I'm going to get you all here, but we're, we're going to do that. So here we were in the little alleyway making stencils. And as you can see, some are boys. including auto. All right, so this gets into my installation that I've created in the, in the deep space at MOCAD. Um, I just uh, was, was thinking about uh, the, the, hyper, the, the hypersexuality of, of Detroit. Detroit is a very sexy city, um, even, even though it's, it's, um, it's sad in some ways in its sexuality, right? Um, and so I thought about the way that women are sexualized. This is a very popular bumper sticker in the Middle East. Instead of, you know, the mud flap girls, because those are not allowed in a lot of countries, you know, where you have the girl that's like, you know. Um, this, is, uh, this is Comet, so you'll see this all over the place. I thought she was just really, really amazing. So I recreated her in this space. I strung up some of my bikinis because I felt like there needed to be a rooftop of, of these bikinis because we can't forget that these sisters are working in these, in, in, in these spaces and, and that, that um, there's, a, there's, an, there's kind of like a, a, a ceiling of, of, uh, of, uh, of um, exploited sexuality. And when I say exploited sexuality, I, I was in this industry, but um, it's, it's, it, the sexuality is exploited on many levels. It's, it's exploited for the person who visits and is self-medicating and, you know, kind of trying to get away from their problems. Um, and uh, it's exploited, uh, you know, on, on many levels it, it's exploited. But also it can be an interesting space, too. So um, I wanted to have this uh, rooftop or ceiling of, of bikinis and, and sex, and then, um, and then this... Uh, Kind of recreation where her hijab is entirely constructed of uh, eyes from fashion magazines which are mostly blue and overly made up anyway that's that's the view from my my home that's the end of my lecture <laughs> that was a lot of images right i'm sorry